And I'd like to thank Liz Hansen for traveling so far to come and give us a presentation. And Liz is a project coordinator for Dr. Gary Johnson's Animal Genetics Lab at the University of, Uni University of Missouri, the College of Veterinary Medicine in Columbus, Missouri. She's also a longtime breeder and exhibitor of standard schnauzers, and more recently, the Berger Picard. There we go. So, thank you, Liz, for coming. We appreciate yeah. it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yes, now I have something probably even more rare than your water spaniel. So, <laughs> so um, if there, since we have such a small group, if there are questions, you can just kind of wave at me and I'll try to answer them as we go. But I might tell you that's coming up in the next slide. So, um, turn on my little thing. So, we're going to go over um, what is degenerative myelopathy, the incidence in your breed, um, a little bit about DNA basics because as breeders that's something that we're all going to have to deal with from here on out and most people forgot what they learned in sixth grade science class and it's all changed anyway. So <laughs> we'll do a little bit of that and hopefully not leave your head swimming. And then what do we have left to learn about DM and um, then a little bit of discussion about any other disease concerns. So degenerative myelopathy was first described in German Shepherds in 1973. Um, it's an old age onset disease. Um, it's not painful. It's progressive weakness starting in the hind legs, progressing forward. It occurs in many purebred dogs. Most, if you've got an older vet, they were trained that it's a disease of big dogs and mostly German Shepherds. But we've seen it in um, a lot of different breeds, which I'll show you here. What we um, used in our study was German Shepherds, of course, Boxers, Chesapeake Bay Retrievers, Pembroke Welsh Corgis, and Rhodesian Ridgebacks. Um, and so what, what's going on with this? It, it's a spinal cord issue, and the spinal cord has two basic parts to it. There's the white matter, which are the tracts of the nerves, um, nerve cells, and then the gray matter is the, the nerve bodies or the, the inner part of, the, um, of the, the spinal cord. And these axons that are in, in the white matter, they're essentially like a wire, okay? And they um, conduct the impulse from a brain to a foot or foot back to the brain. That's how the messages get back and forth. And then they all should have this myelin sheath, which is essentially like insulation on a wire. And what happens in DM is that myelin degenerates. You can see there's holes here instead of what we had in that last slide was, you know, a nice thick coating around each one of those wires. When we have uh, degenerative myelopathy, the myelin, that's the myelopathy part, degenerates, okay? or disappears. And what happens if you take the insulation off a wire? It shorts out. It doesn't work anymore. Okay, so that's why this is a non-painful disease, which, which makes it a little different from other spinal cord issues. There simply is no signal getting from brain to the foot and foot back to the brain. Okay. So the clinical signs, um, they start with um, some loss of function in the hind limbs. Usually owners hear a little scuffing of the toenails. They wear down their back, the toenails on their back foot because they're kind of dragging their toes a little bit. Um, it will pro progress to paralysis and it's really not so much rigid paralysis, it's just that they can't move them, you know. They have no control over them. Um, like I said, it's not painful. There is eventually, well, sometimes earlier on and sometimes much later on, there can be a loss of urinary and fecal continence. And eventually, um, so, you know, if the dogs can get along in a, in a doggy wheelchair once their hind limb ability is gone, um, eventually the front limbs become affected. And if they're maintained beyond that, eventually there's difficulty breathing and swallowing. Um, most big dogs, don't get maintained that that long. The front limbs can be affected too. Mm -hmm. Yep. It usually starts in the rear, progresses forward. With the bigger dogs, usually by the time they can't lift themselves up behind, most owners opt to euthanize them. 
because it's difficult to maintain them. Some dogs accept the doggy wheelchair, the wheel carts, and other dogs just, you know, won't use them. And some people's houses, if you've got a three level narrow <laughs> house, that a doggy wheelchair isn't gonna work very well in that. Um, but some dogs, you know, think the wheelchair is great and they, they get several more months to a year out of life by being in a wheelchair. Um, but yeah, eventually that loss of function keeps progressing forward and um, the, then the front limbs don't have any control. So our current concept of this um, is it's, it's a multi-system. It's both the spinal cords, white matter, um, and then the peripheral nerves. So the spinal cord is called the upper motor neuro, uh, neurons and then the, uh, the little nerves that go from the spinal cord nerves down into the feet and the muscles, um, those are called lower motor neurons. And it does affect those eventually too. If, if what's supplying the little nerves isn't working, then the, pretty soon the little nerves don't uh, work either. And so it's also the, the axons degenerate. So it's just, it starts um, usually central in the spinal cord and then it progresses both towards the brain and towards the rear. But usually the first lesions are about midway in the back if they have a chance to look at the spinal cord early. So a good diagnosis is actually very, very important because um, if there's something wrong with the spine or spinal cord, there's only so many clinical signs that a dog can show you. They can't walk, <laughs> they lose function in their rear, and sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's not. So we can't just, if we see a dog that's going down in the rear, we can't just say, oh, it's DM. Um, we need to rule out other causes. They can have herniated discs, they can have tumors, there are some infections that'll cause similar, similar problems. There's some muscle problems that can cause things like that. Um, so uh, a spinal cord x-ray or um, MRI is also uh, op oftentimes very useful to have. And for example, this dog had not one, but five herniated discs. So that's gonna make him not be able to walk very well, okay? And a lot of veterinarians will see, you know, German Shepherd down in the rear and just say, it's DM, when it may not be. And, you know, depending on how much, how severe it is and how much the owner wants to invest, um, if they have a herniated disc, that can be repaired, okay? Uh, whereas DM, we don't have an effective treatment. Okay, so it, it, and the actu the most definitive diagnosis is to look at the spinal cord um, after the dog has been euthanized. We see some real classic um, changes to the spinal cord that prove that it really was DM. So on a normal spinal cord, this is a, a real slide instead of the little cart cartoon drawing we had earlier. You see it's, it's pretty even blue color um, and that's staining all the myelin that's in there, okay? On a DM dog, red equals trouble, okay? So where you see it's sort of reddish or pinkish, there's no more myelin there, so there's no stain sticking there. And so all these nerve bodies are gone, and all these nerve bodies are gone and degenerating, okay? Yeah. Can I assume when you're referring to the, that information that your DNA test comes first no matter what, right? So Not necessarily, well, this is part of how we, um, we had to be able to define it and know for sure they had DM in order to discover the DNA test. And now we can work with both of them and say, yes, they had the mutations that we know, now know cause this. But initially this was the gold standard and the way to define it for sure. So just backing up one second, if you had a dog and you took it to a vet, let's say you hadn't done a DNA, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be the first step to understand if this DM? Right made? now, it pro well, a, an easy clinical exam, they're gonna look for, does the dog know where its feet are? They kind of turn the foot over and see if they'll turn their foot back the right side up. Because if they're getting a message there and you put their foot with their toes pointing up, they'll flip it right back over, okay? Whereas a DM dog, they're not feeling that foot and they'll just stand there with their foot upside down, okay? Um, so that's an easy thing that they can do clinically. They're gonna check and see is there any pain, 
because pain means we've got something else going on, most likely, or you've got more than one problem going on. But yes, now the DNA test is an easy and relatively cheap um, piece of information to tell you where you stand. And they can have multiple problems going on at the same time. So if you know that they've got a genetic predisposition to it, plus they have a herniated disc, you probably wouldn't opt to spend the money on fixing the disc because they're still not going to get better if they also have DM. Are there so false positives. I mean, for those we'll get to tests. some. We'll get to some of that. Okay. Yep. So, um, so and, and these these are some slides of um, normal nerves and muscle. You can see this is well organized and nice big groups of muscle working together. Whereas in DM. Since there's nothing getting to the muscles, they can't use them. They become all disorganized organized and infiltrated with some fat cells and, and you know that muscle's not going to work nearly as well as a muscle like this. You can see it goes from lots of nerve bodies to it's missing a whole bunch of them. Okay. So um, understanding what the disease was, then we wanted to uh, try to find the gene responsible. So we looked at uh, 38 affected and 17 normal Pembroke Welsh corgis that were well defined. They'd had a pretty good neurologic workup and we were you know, pretty certain that these dogs go in the affected group and these dogs go in the normal group. Um, we found what, uh, we used something called a genome-wide scan where we look for patterns in um, a bunch of DNA markers and see do all the affected dogs have one pattern and the normal dogs have a different pattern and it gives us an idea of a general location and then we did some fine mapping once we thought we were in the right neighborhood uh, it's kind of like a big where's Waldo thing you have to work your way down um, and we added four other breeds to the what we had from the Pembroke Welsh Corgis, the Boxers, German Shepherd, Chessies, and Rhodesian Ridgebacks. And at the time, and we had, we, we found what we thought was the right mutation. So at the time that we discovered this, every dog that we had definitively diagnosed as affected um, by looking at spinal cords had two mutated copies of this gene, okay? And the mutation is in, um, a gene called SOD1, it's superoxase dismutase number one um, gene. And in humans, this SOD1 gene is linked to um, some of the forms of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Now in humans, in this SOD1 gene, there's over 130 known mutations in the one gene. And in the dogs, we had one mutation. but it's the same gene doing the same thing in different species, okay? So then we had those five breeds, which, you know, are corgis and boxers and chessies related to each other. We thought, well, if it's in those five that don't really show any direct relationship, where else is it? So we started surveying other breeds to see um, where else this mutation might exist. Uh, anything that we had DNA banked for any research purposes and I went around and collected some samples at various dog shows. Um, and then we um, announced it at the Boxers National Specialty in uh, May of 2008. They were one of the, um, the Boxer Foundation was one of the major sponsors. Um, so we announced it first there and there are a lot of tears <laughs> because it's been a big heartbreak for them. Um, and then we started offering testing. So um, I said it, it's similar to the ALS in humans uh, or Lou Gehrig's disease. The amyotrophy means muscle weakness or atrophy, okay? And that's the lower motor neuron. We were talking about upper and lower motor neuron. So the muscle weakness is the lower motor neuron. The lateral sclerosis is the axons degenerating, the, the nerve fibers degenerating, and that's the upper motor neuron part. In humans, it's a slow progression, usually about three to five years. Um, mostly unknown cause, they think mostly sporadic, but it could be that we just haven't found all the genes yet. It's a lot harder to find genes in human populations. And there is no useful treatment. There, there's one now that 
when they've reached a point where breathing is difficult can help them for about three months time and that's about all you can add with the current treatments. Um, so it, it eventually is fatal. So as I said there's a lot of different types of ALS and they in humans they start in different areas so they can start muscular and get the other symptoms or they can start in the brain and get other symptoms or they can start in the limbs and get other symptoms and the dogs are mostly most closely match this you know losing function in the limbs first and progressing towards the others and there's undoubtedly a whole host of other genes and other mutations involved in these different sources that all wind up causing you know very similar classic pattern of what they call ALS so where else did we find the mutation? We have found it in, um, my whole slide doesn't show on there. We've, found, we've tested 240 different breeds and we have seen the mutation in 140 different breeds and in mixed breed dogs. So essentially it can be anywhere. Um, we tested 100 golden retrievers and they all tested normal. And then one week in the, in the space of a week, I had two come in from opposite ends of the country that both tested affected. <laughs> so, you know, we're not really going to say that it's completely uh, free of this. It's probably very low incidence in some breeds and a much higher incidence. Um, you can see the numbers here. You guys are one of the higher incidence, but again, we've only tested 108 dogs. So that's not a huge number of dogs tested, but this allele frequency that tells, you know, if we add up all the alleles, and I'm going to get to what an allele is in just a moment, we add up all the alleles that are here and then say how many of them are normal and how many are the mutation, this is hitting right about 50% of the, the genes in your population are coming up with this mutation in the dogs that we've tested. Um, that's not as bad as what we see in wire fox terriers. We've got an allele frequency of 95%. <laughs> We've tested 109 wire fox terriers. We have one tested normal. Now, they don't all show clinical signs before they die. Um, we're, we're kind of starting to think that there may be some secondary mutation that is um, either acting as a protectant for those dogs that, that pushes the age of onset later or something is triggering other breeds to go earlier, we don't really know. Um, but part of the reason the Boxers and the Corgis funded a lot of our research is you can see they've got a serious problem. We've tested um, close to 6,000 Boxers and we only have 705 normals. Um, they're running set about 74% um, mutated genes in Boxers. And in Pembroke Welsh Corgis, you know, 45, 100 dogs and again only 345 testing normal. So that's serious issues there. But the other surprise is something like this, the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, they're running 73% affected. And we have confirmed it by looking at spinal cords in Cavaliers. And I don't think that's been on any veterinarian's radar screen that a toy dog would have this disease. And you know a lot of the little breeds, and here we've got it in pugs, they've got a pretty high frequency as well. Um, and a lot of the little dogs, they can't walk. You can pick them up and carry them around and you know they get along fine. You can carry them wherever you need to. Um, but like I said, with a lot of the bigger breeds, once they can't get themselves up, it's really hard to, um, to maintain them. So, um, so in the Water Spaniels, again, we've tested 108 we only have um, 28 of those tested normal, which is 26% of the dogs we tested. Carrier, we have 53 that tested carrier, which is about 50%, 49% of the dogs. And at risk or affected, we've got 25% of the dogs we tested. Again, I don't know how many total your population is right now, but um, 108 is probably not big enough to give us a really good, true, um, True incidents, um, I suspect it may be a little lower. I hope so. Um, this, the samples we did on a general survey were ones that were banked either just for a DNA bank or for epilepsy research or for some other 
project that they were we already had DNA there and we did probably 30 or 40 dogs that way and then we've had a number of other that people have requested a test since we've had this test available or that a clinician has sent in because they had a dog come into their office and whatever so it may be skewed a little bit towards the dogs that are affected because people want to test if they suspect it or they've seen it in their family of dogs or whatever um, but you know it, it could be that that's about right you know we've got a hundred dogs so um, and as I said here, it's not time to panic, but it's definitely time to be aware of it um, throughout your breed so it doesn't get worse. So how do we interpret a result that says affected? Um, if it says it's affected, that means this dog is at risk for developing clinical signs of DM at some point during its lifetime. Um, generally, the onset for this is eight years old and older, and we don't have a way right now to um, predict which dogs are going to be eight years old when they show clinical signs and which ones are going to be 14 when they show clinical signs, okay? Um, so as I mentioned, there will be dogs that genetically are at risk, but they die from something else before they show a clinical sign. And that's not really a false positive. They, the genetics are there. <laughs> if they live long enough, they'll show signs, okay? Um, yeah, that's, whoops, that's what I just said there. Um, I went the wrong way. Um, but if we eliminate all the dogs that are testing affected or carrier from the gene pool, especially if you do it in one fell swoop, you severely bottleneck the breed. You know, you eliminate your choices and you'll find out what those DM normal dogs are carrying because every dog's got something. <laughs> and when you bottleneck a breed that much, your incidence of something else showing up is, goes way up, okay? And some of these slides are going to be a little bit repetitive. So again, um, the mutation is present here. The risk is real. Um, we do have clinical cases. And, you know, you should, if you've got an older dog, mention this in case you've got a vet that hasn't, you know, it's hard for a general clinician to keep up on every new thing that comes out. Um, so I wouldn't be too upset if they hadn't heard that it could be in your breed. But, you know, that's where you can bring information to them and they can look it up and and we can confirm it. If DM is suspected, we have the DNA test. And um, if when they're euthanized, we still do want to keep looking at spinal cords and muscle biopsies. There's ongoing research that's going on. Um, with the DNA test, then you can make breeding choices uh, that will help you eliminate the incidence of risk, um, but still contribute and keep good genes in the gene pool. So, you know, why do you want to test? Um, I don't think there's any breeder that produces a problem on purpose. You know, I don't sit down and go, hmm, if I do this, maybe I'll get a couple dysplastic and one that'll have seizures and one that'll die from a cardiac disease early. <laughs> you know, nobody does that, but we like to accuse each other as breeders of doing stuff like that, but nobody wants to produce a problem. Nobody wants that phone call with a weeping owner on the other end or you know have a, that you have to live with either. So by DNA testing it doesn't mean the gene police come and shut you down. It means you actually have more choices rather than less. You can use those pedigrees that you know are potentially risky because you know exactly what their genotype is. Okay and you can look at exactly what the genotype is for the dogs you want to breed and make choices that um, will avoid risk while you keep your positive traits, okay? Gradually, of course, you want to select away from this mutation so that um, you can reduce the incidence of the disease. And again, you're using this information to make wise choices, keep the good, and reduce the incidence of the bad. So which dogs should be tested? Um, any dog that's contributing to the gene pool or you know, you're know, you considering having it contribute to the gene pool, um, current and potential fu future breeding stock. And you mentioned if you've got frozen semen, we can test that too. Um, we, can use, we can use frozen semen if you, to make DNA but if you have a limited amount of frozen semen and it's more valuable as puppies than as DNA because we need essentially a full breeding unit, um, 
then what we tell people to do is find a bitch that's DNA tested normal and you, and you cannot produce an affected dog with one normal parent. Okay, so you can use an unknown frozen semen sire on a bitch that's tested normal, test the puppies, and you may be able to figure out what the, what the genotype is. Because if any of those puppies test carrier, you know the sire has to be a carrier. Okay. Um, really important to, you, to test these widely used sires because they have a, a disproportionate influence on the breed. So very important to know um, what their genetic makeup is. Um, if on the offspring, the puppies, if one or both parents didn't test normal, if you're breeding normal to normal, you can't have anything but normal. So if you, but if one of the parents was a carrier or one of the parents was affected, then you want to um, DNA test the puppies. If you have two equally good puppies and one test carrier and one test normal, I think I know which one you keep, you know? Uh, and you might sell the, the carrier dog and let people know this one's carrier, you have to be careful when you breed it. And you can test um, a dog at any age, essentially. Um, in theory, you can do it the moment they're born, but it's really hard to get a good cheek swab sample on a little itty bitty puppy. But if you wait till they're about at least three or four weeks old, you can get a cheek swab sample enough to do the DNA test. Is there any reason to um, test spaded dogs that are not part of the gene pool? I mean, is there any real benefit well, to your 25, 50, 25 proportion? Well, yeah, um, spayed or neutered dogs, uh, it would be, it would add to the total to help us get a breed-wide incidence. Um, but the other thing is, you know, it will, it can give you an idea of what may be coming down the road. So, you know, it, if, if this dog's spayed and it's three or four years old and it does test at risk, then do whatever you're going to do before they're eight or nine years old because you know that they're probably going to start deteriorating later, you know. So get your performance events all taken care of um, early on before they start showing signs. The other thing is that um, we, do, um, we do have hope of a, of a treatment eventually, okay. So um, if you had a dog that was at risk, then you'd want to stay tuned in because if we can develop a treatment, then you'd probably want to be in that clinical trial or, or get them started on that. Um, the um, the uh, uh, spinal cord does start to deteriorate pretty quickly. And so within about six hours, it needs to be removed. The sample we need needs to be removed and get into fixative or it starts to become mush and not diagnostic anymore. Okay, so I've tossed out a bunch of words here on um, DNA. So we're going to go a little bit of the ABCs of DNA and um, hopefully that'll help help with understanding not just this test but there will be more DNA tests that apply to your breed um, over over time. So we've got a whole you know we've got a whole long alphabet. DNA just has a short alphabet of A, C, G, and T. And these are called nucleotides. They're just little bits of um, in the in the genetic soup that's in every sing single cell uh, that are the building blocks for DNA. And the way this double helix that you probably have seen, um, that's the DNA molecule, the way it replicates itself is when it splits in half in that genetic soup that's in every cell, and A tries to find a T, and a G tries to find a C in that soup, and they latch on a new one, and they can make an exact copy. Okay? If they don't make an exact copy, then we've got a mutation. Something went wrong. So just like we use our alphabet to make words, we use this little four-letter alphabet of nucleotides to make something called codons. It's just a little three-letter, three-nucleotide-long word, which, you know, a word all by itself doesn't usually have any meaning, but if you put a bunch of words together and make a paragraph, that can have instructions. If you put a bunch of codons together, you get something called a gene that has an instruction, okay? And you put all these genes together and you've got a chromosome, just like your paragraphs make a chapter, all the chapters make a book, all the chromosomes are how to build a dog, or a cat, or a flower, whatever, okay? So hopefully 
that makes that a little easier to understand. So the dogs have um, 38 chromosomes and then the X and Y or sex chromosomes. This little dot here with an MT by it, that's called the mitochondrial genome, which you inherit only from your mother. And all the geneticists argue about exactly how that works, so we're not even gonna talk about it today. Because <laughs> um, if they can't agree, I'm not gonna try to straighten it out for them. And they just numbered it in what originally they thought was the biggest to the smallest. But you can see they've adjusted the sizes now that we can do it more accurately and, and look at them better. So what's a genome sequence? We hear that in the news. I Actually driving up here, they were talking about they've sequenced the octopus genome now. Yay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I bet that's a big relief to everybody. <laughs> But what is a genome sequence? The genome sequence is just the long string of nucleotides in the order they're assembled. So just, you know, it's, it's one, it's these four letters repeated over and over and over in a pretty unique um, repetition. Uh, and it makes the complete instruction manual for that species. So it's a massive amount of data and sorting through it is really difficult. Um, we can read bits and pieces of it, but we still are learning how to read the whole thing. And what we're looking for in this whole genome sequence, when we're trying to find a disease or any other trait, is something called a polymorphism. And poly just means many, and morph is form. So polymorphism is a different sequence at the same location on a chromosome. So if, this is my little example, we'll call this our get something clean gene. And if it says, has a G here, that means give the dog a bath. And if it has a T in that same spot, we give the cat a bath, okay? They both get something clean, okay? And each one of those different variable options is called an allele. So each form of the gene or a DNA marker is called an allele. There can be many different alleles within one species uh, or breed. But each individual has only two alleles. You get one from dad and one from mom, okay? So we've got give the dog a bath, give the cat a bath, give the bug a bath, doesn't make sense, but whatever, give the car a bath. If it said give the angry tiger a bath, that would be a lethal because you'd be dead at the end, okay? <laughs> so, and so how do these alleles get from one generation to the next? Um, hopefully this is review for most people, but um, most commonly, they're expressed as um, a dominant trait, a recessive trait, or a sex-linked trait. And so, um, just a little explanation of what all this is. This is something called a Punnett square, and it helps you estimate what, what are the possibilities that you could get. So what the dad's genotype is, is across the top. The dad's two alleles are here, and the mom's two alleles are here. And I've used a red D to mean disease and a black N to mean normal, okay? And then this is what the geneticists use as a pedigree. If you, if you turned it 90 degrees, you'd have it the way breeders use it with names on it. But we use a square to mean a male, a circle to mean a female, and these two mated together produce this litter. If the, if the shape is filled in, that means they have that trait or they have that disease. It can be a good trait too, but that, this is just how you represent who's got the trait, who doesn't have the trait, and you can start to see a pattern to figure out how this, how this trait is being inherited. So if it's a dominant trait, you have affected offspring born to an affected parent. Okay, you expect to see about 50% of the puppies affected, and you expect to see about half uh, male and half female in the affecteds. Okay, you only need one bad copy to see the disease. It dominates, you know, it takes over. <laughs> so we've got mom has the, has the disease, and she's got this bad copy and then a normal copy. So bred to a normal sire, if you get normal from dad, a disease from mom, that puppy's gonna be, have the disease. Same thing here, and here they got normal and normal, and those puppies are normal, so about 50%. Make sense? Okay, if we have a recess, recessive trait, this is what gets breeders tripped up, because you say, I've never seen this, all my dogs are normal, how did I get an affected puppy? Recessive trait, 
you need two bad copies to show the disease. So we have affected offspring being born to normal parents. Um, so here we've got normal mom, normal dad, and we've got disease, and we've got disease, and we've got disease here. So what's happening here is if you've got one normal copy of the gene, that's enough normal instructions for the body to function normal, okay? This sire has one normal copy and then one mutated copy, but since it's a recessive disease, he's got enough normal instructions to, to appear normal. But when you breed it to another that's a carrier, some of the puppies get normal from dad and normal from mom, and they're normal, okay? Some of the puppies get disease from dad and normal from mom, they're gonna be a carrier. Normal from dad, disease from mom, they're gonna be a carrier. If they're unlucky enough to get disease from dad and disease from mom, there's no normal instructions here. That's where you get the disease, okay? Um, so we expect to see 25% affected, 25% normal, 50% carriers. And we also expect to see about even males and females. This doesn't have any sex bias either. And then there's something called a X-linked or a sex-linked recessive. Uh, the males, in order to be male, they're XY, so they only have one functional X chromosome. And so um, we expect to see 50% of the males affected and 50% of the females are carrier. Um, so again, we've got a normal male, but bred to this carrier female, some are gonna be a normal female, some are gonna be carrier females. If they get, if it's a male puppy, they got the Y from dad. If they get the good X from mom, they're a normal male. If they get the bad X from mom, they've got the disease. Um, we're working on a sex-linked alopecia that's in Pomeranians and several other um, spitz type dogs. Case hounds have it, uh, Alaska Malamutes have it. Um, and the breeders, especially the Poms, will say, oh, it all goes back to this one stud dog that everybody bred to. Nope. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it's all coming from the carrier bitches. Okay? So the only way you can get an affected female is if you took this affected male and bred it to a carrier female, then you could get XX and have an affected female. But most people, if they know it's affected, are not gonna breed the, uh, an affected male, okay? Oh, I wanna back up a second here. With the dominant, this would be easy. If our diseases were dominant, you simply never breed an affected dog and you never see the affected puppy, okay? But most, and if this was a trait that we really wanted to have, like the perfect curly hair, <laughs> If you, you know, if you had a dog with the perfect curly hair, half of the puppies are going to have that perfect hair and half of the puppies won't. But so, you know, if it's a dominant trait, that's good. It's, it's pretty easy to manage. But most of the traits that we're dealing with are recessive or they're more than one gene. Okay. So we have um, a new and powerful tool, something called whole genome sequencing where we can do the entire genetic sequence for one individual. This used to be very, very expensive and take months and months or a year even um, to get done. Now we've got new technology that's changing this and it's changing rapidly. Um, we can do it on campus now in about two weeks for $5,000, which is hard for me to write a personal check for, but in terms of research dollars, $5,000 is not much at all, okay? Um, we're one of the, uh, University of Missouri Columbia is one of the leaders in that. We have a lot of other labs that are sending their samples to us for sequencing and some of them we just send the raw data back and let them interpret it. Some of them they ask us to interpret it. But we currently have, actually I didn't update this, we have about 116 dogs um, sequenced and um, Plus we have about 20 to 25 wild canids that were sent by somebody at UC Davis that's been working on um, wild canids around the world. And so all of these um, other dogs can become a normal control for whatever disease we're looking at. So what we do is we, we uh, get the sequence from one individual um, and we evaluate it to make sure that we've got good DNA and lots of it. And we can't, 
replicate that whole string. We have to we have to multiply it in order to do this, and we can't do the entire string all together. So it gets broken into fragments, and there's a way to break it into fragments that are the size we want them. So we make some of the fragments 200 of those nucleotides long, and some of them 400 nucleotides long, so or 500 nucleotides. So they're not. Um, so we have, you know, fairly good sized chunks. Um, and then there's a way to multiply all those fragments so we have lots and lots and lots of DNA that goes into the sequencer. It goes into the sequencer and that picks up one of the fragments and figures out what the, what the uh, letters are there in that fragment. Picks up the next fragment, figures out what letters are in that fragment, okay? Then when we've got all those reads out, then we have to line them up in the proper order. So we have the canine genome, the canine reference sequence that all the genetic researchers use, and you use it kind of like the picture on the box of the puzzle that your jigsaw puzzle you're putting together. They, you take the, the read and see where does it match exactly on this genome sequence, okay? <coughs> Plugs in right there. And where does the next one match? And where does the next one match? Until you have all these reads lined up somewhere on the genome. Okay, then we have a custom algorithm that we've written to search for changes. Where is it different from the picture on the puzzle box? Where is it different from the whole genome sequence? And then we look and see where is it different from all those other genomes that we've sequenced. Um, and oftentimes that will let us figure things out. So again, we're well, there's a lot of different changes. This is, this is what we see, and I know you can't see all the details here. Along the top here is the number, which, which nucleotide we're looking at here. So it's, you know, one million, two million, three million. You know, it's got all the numbers <laughs> there. Um, and each one of these is, is a letter here, and each one of these is one of those reads. So one of those chunks of DNA, and a bunch of them plugged in here, and you can see one of them ended right there, and then another new piece started there and went zoop off the, off the end there. So that's why there's gaps here, is, you know, the pieces plugged in in different places. And this is the reference sequence, that's what they, the, the canine genome says, and then this is called consensus. This is, they look at all the reads we got on this individual dog and what are, what is the consensus among all those reads we get. And what we're looking for is something that's different from the uh, whole genome sequence. So here there's supposed to be a C on the whole, on the uh, reference sequence, and this is what we call a heterozygous sequence variant. Some of these are C's, and some of them are A's, okay? So this dog would be a, a carrier. We don't know what trait that is, but there's something. They've got both copies of the allele showing up in their genome. Uh-oh, don't tell me no signal. Oh, no. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh-oh, let's see here. How'd you know a normal one? You say it became a carrier. How do you know that the C was normal and the A was abnormal? Uh, just a second here. Let me get, let me get this back. Next slide. It's showing you my whole screen instead of just showing you the. Let me try this. It's okay. We have it all on video. Slideshow <laughs> from current slide. Okay, so this is the reference sequence. That's, that's what they took several million dollars and several years to put together, the, the original um, puzzle. <laughs> and then we just match all this to that. Why is it doing that? Huh, something's not a good connection for some reason. This is all connected. Uh, it shouldn't be that because the video is still on. It's a connection between the computer and the video. And now somehow we're not on here the same. Okay. So, um, like I said, on, on this individual dog, 
These are all from one dog. Okay, we got many, many, many reeds, and we like to have, this is called depth of coverage. If we have a whole bunch of reeds in the same place, we can be pretty sure that when all of them are tees, every, every one we could possibly find is gonna be a T. Okay, but in this position, some of them came up A and some of them came up C. So we know this dog has both alleles in its genome. Okay, at this position, this dog all came up C's, and the reference sequence says it should be a T, okay? So if this was a disease allele, this dog would have this disease, okay? Because it doesn't have the normal copy right there. Does that make sense? Is the reference canine or is the reference water spaniel? The reference is, is canine. It actually originally was a boxer named Tasha. <laughs> and then they added to that a uh, poodle that some other person that was heavily involved in it decided to do and they sort of made a consensus with those two dogs that were the first two that were ever sequenced. Okay, and now everybody uses that as a reference. And of course, there's some mutations in there that make a boxer a boxer and so of course they're going to be different for a water spaniel. Okay. We can make a water spaniel reference if we did if we did a whole genome sequence on, you know, three or four or five of them and saw what's the same on all these water spaniels. We could certainly do that and make. Dr. Yeah. If, if you know that you have a dog that's infected, uh huh, and maybe a year from now you may have to put him to sleep uh -huh. or her. Um, how much of the spinal cord? material do you need or do you need any extra material or should you just uh, um, send in uh, cheek swabs? What's, what's the best way to? Um, I actually, I think I'll get to that when we're doing more about the testing. I think I've got some of that uh, uh, further on here. So um, this sounds all great, but has it actually worked? Well, we've found um, more of these. We actually probably set a time, a land speed record um, on Thursday. We had a Cana Corso with something called NCL, this um, neuronal ceroid lipofusinosis, which is, it's a, it's a storage disease. The, the bodies of the um, cell, I wonder if this is doing something odd. Um, I wonder if I'm touching something funny on here. Um, the bodies of the nerve cells store garbage that should leave the cell. And you know, if you've got too much garbage, it's hard to function. <laughs> Eventually the cell dies. And um, so we had one of those. We did a whole genome sequence. Um, they, we got the alignment out and um, the first first gene that they looked at, it was the first, <laughs> first exon on the first gene that they looked at. And so it was about three and a half minutes after we had the alignment, we had the mutation found. But on these NCLs, we know, we know what we're targeting. We can go right to the genes we know causes NCL and see if there's a different mutation there. So yes, it has worked um, really well. And we also found um, dilated cardiomyopathy in standard schnauzers this way. Um, and I'll show you a little little um, bit about how we figured that out. So we had all these dogs, these standard schnauzers with dilated cardiomyopathy that we had sampled for the research. We did a whole genome sequence on one standard schnauzer with dilated car cardiomyopathy. It was a male, began showing clinical signs at 12 months, um, confirmed the DCM diagnosis, euthanized at 13 and a half months due to rapidly failing quality of life issues. And we took every tissue that we could possibly ever need um, for, for future research on this dog. So we got, we did the uh, whole genome sequence on this dog. And from the mutation report, um, initially there were over 7 million sequence variants or changes from the reference sequence, okay? That's way too much for us to find anything from. So then we say, okay, which of these sequence variants are unique to this dog. They're not in the other whole genome sequences that we've done, because all of those other dogs don't have this disease. So then we had 321,000 sequence variants that were unique just to this dog, okay? So now how many of those are um, homozygous variants? Because we're looking for a recessive disease, looking at that genetic map 
Um, I'll go back here. So if we look at this map, we have normal parents and we have affected offspring and we got about equal males and females, so looks recessive. Okay, so that's the model we were looking at. So, um, so there's, there were 8,000 of the v variants that would fit a recessive model. Okay, then we looked at those. How many of those variants would change the amino acid that's produced? That would, you know, change how that gene was put together. Well, there's 74 of those. Eight of those made the gene inactive, made the gene would, would not work. And one of those, when we, that's a manageable number. We can look and see what's known about those genes. One of those is associated with DCM in humans and lab rats, okay? So that's how we work our way down when we're, we're doing this whole genome sequencing. So then we had to say, you know, that looked good, so is it really the right, so we had nine confirmed cases, all nine had that mutation. We tested the parents. All the parents tested carrier, all the siblings were carrier or normal, except one that tested affected, and this was a surprise. Um, we had one that tested affected, and so that dog was brought in and clinically evaluated, and even though it wasn't showing clinical signs that the owner noticed, when they did an echocardiogram, it did have um, the, the start of dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, and it, it, it says, has since progressed, that dog was euthanized about oh, two weeks ago. Um, then we did random samples from all the standard schnauzers we had, and they all tested carrier or normal, all the dogs that were normal. So this all gives us really good evidence that it's um, the right mutation. And this is the mutation report for, for this mutation. You really don't need to know a whole lot about genetics to see if you're missing all those pieces of your gene, it's not going to work right. Okay, so this was sort of a slam dunk. There is no way this gene is working when you have, I think it's like 22 base pairs just completely gone missing. Okay, so um, again, um, with this, the normal means the dog's got two normal alleles, the gene's gonna function normally, it can only give a normal copy of a gene to its offspring. That's all it's got to give to its puppies. A carrier means it's got one normal and one mutated or disease allele. And the, gene, the gene's going to function normally with the normal allele, but it can give either one of those alleles to the offspring. And um, affected means they've got two bad alleles, no correct instructions, and the dog will eventually develop the disease. Um, like I said earlier, the clinical signs start of DM start appearing anywhere from eight years of age and older. Some are much older. Um, we're actually working with a group of Pembroke Welsh Corgis that all have this mutation. They are all testing at, at risk or affected, but some of them show, showed clinical signs when they are eight or nine or ten years old, and some of them were 14, 15, we even have one that was 16 years old before it showed any clinical signs. So they've all got the basic mutation that they should get the disease, but why do some get it early and some get it late? And if we could tell people that, that would maybe help in making the decision-making process as well. Um, so we're looking for a mutation that may be either triggering things to start or protecting things and not letting it start. And that also might help us understand how to treat it, how to develop a treatment to, um, to delay things. Okay. So this is what we have left to learn. You know, what does influence that age of onset? Um, are there other undiscovered mutations? I, you know, I told you the SOD1 in humans for ALS, we know of 130 different mutations and dogs we had just one. We did have a Bernese Mountain Dog that um, tested normal on this test. It had classic clinical signs of DM. When it was euthanized, they sent us the cord and it had the classic affected cord. Everything looked like it was affected. And so we resequenced that gene and there is a second mutation in the SOD1 gene that we found that so far we have only seen in Bernese Mountain Dogs. 
um, and at a very low level. It's only, it's under 5% of the Bernese Mountain Dogs have that second mutation. Um, and we also do have a few dogs that test carrier that have developed clinical DM, so we're trying to understand that. They shouldn't, um, but we have confirmed uh, very few cases. I think we've, we've DNA tested almost 50,000 dogs. We have cords on about three or 400, I think, and I think we have five carriers that we know did develop um, clinical DM. So um, why that would happen? We don't know. Um, and can an effective treatment be developed? Um, Dr. Joan Coates is the neurologist that's been leading this, and she now has funding from the ALS Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, and um, she's completed um, some clinical trials to look at the safety of a proposed treatment on some um, research dogs. They, you know, gave them this proposed treatment and made sure that it didn't, like, wipe out their liver or wipe out their kidneys or something because if you can slow DM down but you kill the dog <laughs> from organ failure, it hasn't done you much good. Okay, so <laughs> um, it's past that test and she's started to, do, to enroll some boxers and um, I think it's just boxers so far at a very limited um, clinical trial. Some are getting a placebo, some are getting this proposed treatment. Um, and the other thing she's spent several years now looking at categorizing each step of the development of this disease so that we have a yardstick to measure this treatment by because you can't just say oh they look better or this one was you know it, it lasted longer um, we have to have we have to be able to prove that you know usually it's this many months between the initial stages to the secondary stages to the third stage to to death and she's got that all mapped out now and um, like I said, it, it's pretty exciting. She's got a, um, a clinical trial starting that the reason the ALS Foundation is interested in it is if we can make it work in dogs, um, it may translate to humans with ALS as well. So that's hopeful um, for the future. <sighs> there must be some little thing I'm touching here, I think. Come on. Uh, okay, I think I'll put this down. Um, <laughs> so, um, how do we, I, and I know I'm being repetitive here, but um, how do we use these wisely? You can screen the parents prior to breeding to estimate the risk of producing an affected offspring. Use those little predicting things. Screen puppies so you know their genetic status while you're trying to sort out who stays and who goes to a pet home or you know, who gets to do what. And again, gradually work towards using only DNA from normal dogs for breeding and eliminate the risk of additional affected dogs in the breed. But you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You're not breeding a test result, you have to breed a dog. Okay, so don't get so hung up on the test result that that's all you pay attention to. Um, you can and should continue to use carrier dogs in breeding programs for their good qualities. You can also consider using outstanding dogs that test at risk. If you, te if you breed an at-risk dog to a DNA-tested normal dog, what are those puppies going to be? Carrier. carrier, right. They're not going to get the disease. They're going to be carriers. You keep those good traits, and hopefully you can breed that carrier then to a normal, the next generation, and you know keep the good stuff and work away from the bad. But you don't want to dump all of them. Okay, it's not my remote. <laughs> um, I'm going to unplug the remote and see if that helps. I don't, I don't think that's it, but... Um, but if you t right now, if you take all the carriers and affect it out of the gene pool in one swoop, you've taken 74% of your gene pool out. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that's not going to work well. <laughs> that's not going to come out good for your breed. Um, so you have to maintain that genetic diversity and keep those positive traits that these dogs may have. And that's going to take cooperation and careful planning 
on everybody's part and cooperation with each other and not you know bashing each other saying oh they're breeding carriers or that they bred that at risk dog there may be very good reasons to be breeding that dog you just need to have the information and use that information as you're making your choices um, and I'll get your question about sampling at the end here. Um, so what else do we need to solve? Um, we had gotten a bunch of samples for epilepsy. Do we still need to solve that? Is that still happening in the breed or is epilepsy gone? <laughs> I can't believe it's gone. You know, it's probably gone underground again. <laughs> um, hmm? Did you use all those epile epilepsy samples? They're not used up, they're banked. But, but to the um, DM, I mean, did you transfer that data or is it no. used, cross-referenced or anything? Um, we did use some of the DNA that was banked on some of those dogs. What we, what we told the people in the lab was we, all the DNA samples are stored in little bitty tubes in a box by breed. And we said, all right, you know, do a random. They just pulled out the American Water Spaniel box and they took every fifth tube out of there. They don't know who they sampled or whatever. They just did a random sampling of DNA that we had stored for any reason. Okay, so, um, and that's what we did with, with all the breeds. We just did a random sampling of DNA that was in our freezers for any reason. So yes, some of the dogs that were sampled for the epilepsy research have been DNA tested. But, uh, and uh, I'm sure it was probably just a guess on your part, but how many AWS DNA for various reasons do you think you have available to you? I meant to look that up and I think I forgot to do that. Um, I'll have to find that. I think we've probably got 250, maybe 300 dogs wow. sampled. Oh, oh, okay. Maybe. Now, what are so. the odds that at some point in time you just may say, hey, we're going to test all of them? Well, right now, in terms of, of general knowledge of, of um, the DM, we probably sort of figure that we know what we need to know and have moved on to treatment and are there other mutations and that type of thing. So we probably won't because that costs time and money. Okay. <laughs> but if the breed club said, hey, we want you to test every right. single dog, this leads to my next question. then, you know, and if the breed club wanted to come up with some money to pay for the time and the reagents and whatever, we could probably do that. You know, it's possible to do. What we've been doing is whenever we discover a mutation, um, our thank you to the people that had DNA there that was available for us to use during research is um, you can request a test on your dog that has DNA in our freezers for $35. You get your test result. Um, and normal, a new sample coming in, it's $65. So. Um, that, that's just our way that you know people can get the results on their dogs that have been banked in the past. We'll, we'll run the test. Like I said, they were doing it randomly and fast and we go back and when somebody wants it for that dog we know that they want, <laughs> want to make absolutely certain so we always rerun that sample um, just in case the technician was going fast and you know messed something up. We don't think they, anybody did but if, if we're reporting a result to you, we're going to make sure we pull that exact sample and retest it. So. You have access to these samples that go to Gensol and these other labs? That, yep. So we have to, the, what's the best way to do to get them all in one place to see, see what the, um, what's it, should we send OFA or? Do you guys do the, the CHIC program through OFA, the Canine Health Information Center? Use their DNA bank. The Chick DNA Bank is available to any qualified researcher. And a dog that's banked through the Chick DNA Bank by blood sample can contribute to many different research projects. Um, what we're sort of, we're the service lab for the Chick DNA that comes in as blood samples at Missouri. And if, um, that is so weird. I know. There it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, um, if a researcher contacts Eddie Zook over at OFA and says, hey, I'm doing a study on glaucoma and here are my criteria and I want 
golden retrievers, he'll go through the golden retrievers that are banked and find the ones that fit this researcher's criteria and then they get the least amount of sample that will um, <laughs> that will uh, allow them to do their research and um, so that way you know the, those sam they never get the whole sample um, when they go off to different labs and, and whatever they live in somebody's freezer and may never see the light of day again so so are you saying maybe next year at the National we should take blood samples of water spaniels yep. and donate to the... Yep. A lot of them, a lot of breed clubs do that, have a, a DNA draw at their, um, at the National and... Um, we did for <laughs> This is very odd because that's... Yeah. yeah. So, um, now she asked, and I, I thought I had a slide in here about what samples to send in. So, if you want to um, DNA bank, you want to do that from a blood sample because that gives us a lot of high quality DNA and it will work for whatever. Uh, process gets invented. The cheek swabs are, and when we're doing research we have to have a high quality and high amount of DNA because um, we don't know how many times we're going to have to keep asking questions until we find the answer. Um, once we've identified a mutation then we can look for that one mutation and see what the dog's status is with the little bit of DNA you get from a cheek swab. So that's why we offer our tests in um, collaboration with OFA. You can order the DM test on the OFA's website um, and they will send you a kit to collect DNA using a cheek swab and a little barcoded card. And the swab is just to get cheek cells and saliva onto this little card, which changes color to let you know that you've got sample on it. And then that card gets mailed into us. We scan it in, run the sample, and it and the report gets sent back to you by OFA. Um, if you've got a dog that's clinical, um, and you go into the vet, you can you can have the vet send a blood sample. Um, but it's usually less expensive and easier for most people to do the DM test using the cheek swab. Um, like I said, the the DNA banking is a really good idea. I think it's an it's something that um, the two clubs I'm involved in somehow <laughs> some little influence made them put uh, banking DNA one of the chick requirements and I, I strongly feel that if your dog's contributing to the gene pool you should have DNA in the bank because at some point it may be needed for research or you may want it for testing if you've got frozen semen like I said, if, you, if we don't have any DNA banked on that dog and he's long gone and all you've got is frozen semen, yes, we can use that frozen semen to make DNA, but then you're choosing, is this DNA going to make, or is this frozen semen going to make puppies or is it going to make DNA? But if you've got DNA banked, you know, so when you're freezing semen on your dogs, send a blood sample in so you've got DNA banked and then whatever test comes up, 10, 20 years from now when that dog's long gone, you've got a way to test it without using your frozen semen. Okay. Um, if, if they suspect that the dog has DM, we do have a cord protocol that's written out for what to send and how to send it. They're, they're looking at the spinal cord, but there's also some muscle and nerve biopsies that Dr. Coates is looking at that's continuing on the research for the um, all for the dogs and for the ALS uh, uh, research as well. But we're helping the dogs first and then the dogs get to help ALS later <laughs> as a secondary thing. Um, and so, you know, that protocol needs to be followed um, to get those samples. And I don't know if I pushed yeah, off. And if we did something next year, here, we, you better be getting blood samples rather than using cheeks around. Yes, definitely. Yep. Um, hello. So, um, I guess the other thing was, the uh, other question I had up there is, you know, do you have other issues? I don't know if you've got PRA that's not, you, you don't have a DNA test for, um, cataracts, heart issues, heart murmurs. You know, that, that's something that 
you know, w with the whole genome sequencing, we're getting to a point where we can solve a lot of this stuff. That's She's thyroid. got thyroid. So some of the autoimmune genes are going to take a little longer to figure those out. They're very complicated and complex. Um, we have a new machine coming in probably the first of the year. It's a quarter million dollar multiplexing machine so it can run up it they tell us it can run 30 or 40 tests in one tube instead of doing 40 40 tubes to do 40 tests we can do it all in one tube and multiplex them and that's going to take the cost per assay that we run way way down and for epilepsy research and other stuff that we're doing that's going to be complicated our plan is to look is to make a, a custom panel that has all the genes that are known to be linked to epilepsy in humans and just run every epileptic dog we have and see if we can get some risk factors showing up here and there or start getting some hits on some of the genes that are known in other species. And so hopefully this new technology, um, once it gets set up and, and we learn how to run it well, um, will help us get some of these more complicated things. The whole genome sequencing, like I said, we're getting really, really good at that. And we've had a couple of occasions where if we couldn't find it using just one dog, um, we did this with the soft-coated Wheatons that have a, a movement disorder. They, they sort of spastically start moving and can't control their, their movements. Um, and it, uh, we couldn't find it with doing one gene. We found a lot of mutations, but none of them um, were in genes that, that there was a function known. So we sequenced the second soft-coated Wheaton with the same problem and said, what's the same with these two dogs and different about everything else? And there was one gene that hasn't been described in humans, so nobody knew what the function was, but it was pretty clear that's what was responsible for that. And now we've gone back to the human researchers and there are some dyskinesias or uh, um, movement disorders in humans that haven't been explained and they're going to screen all of them for this mutation that we found in the dogs and see if that explains some of the humans that haven't been able to be explained. So it, it's, it's exciting stuff um, to be part of. So. Tell us more about the treatment. The treatment is, um, well, can you tell us more about the two? I, I have, uh, Joan and I haven't sat down and really gone through this, but um, she just presented this at the Canine Health Foundation conference that was last weekend. Um, and uh, um, what the mutation does is, you know, we usually think when there's a mutation, things stop working, but this mutation makes, makes it work too much. They call it a toxic gain of function. And the SOD1 gene is supposed to pick up free radicals um, that, are, that are in the system. And this, like, picks up everything. <laughs> and, and it accumulates all these granules into the cell body. So what she's trying to do is disrupt that so that it's not scavenging everything, that it's working at a lower level instead of um, working over time like it does. And so, you know, will that extend things out? You know, we don't know. But, uh, we'll see. Do you know anything about that? The problem is it has to go into the spinal cord, and because there's a blood-brain barrier, it's hard to get things into the spinal cord and whatever. So, yeah, they're, they're, it's, uh, I know the dogs with the that are in the clinical trial so far have to be within commute distance of Columbia, Missouri, because they have to come in every month and have a complete workup done. Um, but the Boxer Club is covering the cost of doing that. Um, they've made a major donation. The Boxer Club and the ALS Foundation and the National Institutes of Health are all contributing to that. So, um, and you know, we'll see how this first phase goes and in another year or two they may be enrolling more dogs from more different breeds um, to, to you know, answer more questions, but it's really at an early stage right now. So, somebody else had a question. Just maybe I'm misunderstanding something, but I want to get back to it, which is the genome sequence and use, which uh -huh. is something about having five or six dogs at about 5K a dog, yeah. get us a baseline. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. How beneficial is that baseline? Well, over time it probably will be. I mean, what we could do is, I, well, what we're doing, what Dr. Johnson calls um, 
um, it, it's kind of coming in the back door. We're, we're looking at any mutation that we can find in these whole genome sequences that we have. And so um, th th we might be able to see, well, we found in several of the dogs that we sequenced for other neurologic problems that they, uh, some of them have been um, uh, heterozygous for a gene that we know causes retinitis pigmentosa in humans, or which is the equivalent of PRA in dogs. And so is PRA a problem in that breed? Then we go looking and see, is that there? Um, we have picked up some that cause a heart, um, uh, some AFib. And AFib doesn't usually have, atrial fibrillation doesn't usually happen in dogs, um, other than a secondary problem to other heart defects. And, but we picked up, you know, one of the mutations we looked at, then we looked to see what gene it's in, it causes AFib in humans. So is that a problem in that breed? You know, so we're, we have a lot of these that the dogs are carriers for. So that dog that we did the whole genome sequence on isn't showing the trait, but maybe that's a problem in the breed and we look further for that. So that's what you can get by doing um, some of the breeds we have two or three or four dogs sampled and we can start to look at what's common in these dogs from this breed, what maybe, you know, what makes this, what makes a Picard a Picard, <laughs> or what makes a Water Spaniel a Water Spaniel that's different from, from other breeds. Um, we haven't really gotten to that because we're busy solving diseases right now, but that certainly is something you can do. So at this stage and what we're talking about here, how beneficial is that as a goal? I mean, is that something we should really as Well, a what it, be what it about? could probably do, um, and what we're thinking of setting up is, you know, we'll, we'll do a whole genome sequence on anybody that wants their dog sequenced. And, um, you know, then what we want to do is, is we can make a mutation report and say, we found mutations in all of these genes and this might indicate that there could be a problem with this and this and this and this and this. So in the future, you may be able to do that on, you know, your wonderful stud dog and say, all right, here's things where we need to be aware and maybe not line breed on you know, a family that has a heart defect or something like that because we know that this dog is carrying something that might cause a heart defect. So um, we're talking about doing so things like that, but um, I don't know that we, we haven't been the mutation reports fast enough to be able to tell you, you know, in, in just a real short time, okay, here's all the problems that might be indicated by this, but it would give you a pretty good picture of what's going on in the breed and, and where we see mutations in various different things. And like she asked about the thyroid, we can probably start getting at some of those more complicated things if we see, you know, a bunch of defects in a cluster of autoimmune genes and we don't see those in some other breed that's not showing, um, showing the same thing. So, how many dogs and how much money per dog? It's, um, it's, it costs us out of pocket $5,000. We usually charge 6000 for the first one because it's about $1,000 of processing and evaluation and, and interpreting all the results. But, you know, so what we've, with other clubs, it's been 6000 for one, and then every additional one is 5000 because that's, that's what we have to pay the core. As things get more efficient, you know, Five years from now, it'll probably be a thousand dollars a dog. Yeah, there's, there's, they're always making better, faster, newer machines. So, so you know, where you jump into the process, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to get better and cheaper, but it's probably useful. How many dogs do you need to have something useful? One with a disease. You know, we're identifying a lot of these diseases with one dog with a disease. And then, but we do need samples, like I showed on that standard Schnauzer example, we identified the mutation in that one dog. To prove that we were right, then we looked at all the other dogs that we had, and do, do they all fit the pattern the way they should, okay? So, you know, we need one to find it, <laughs> but then we need others to um, prove that it's not just a private mutation in that one dog you know, that it actually applies to the breed in general, um, or dogs in general, uh, in the case of DM. So, so. Within a breed? You probably have a pretty clear picture if you chose 
five dogs that were as unrelated as possible in this breed, you know, that are, are the different avenues of this breed, you probably could get a pretty good picture. So does that mean the blood, bank blood from wherever could be, be drawn upon for those same tests at any given time or not? For, 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 the genome for the genome sequencing, it kind of depends on how good a sample we got when it came in. Um, if we got, you know, if we only got a mil or two of blood, that, that makes a pretty good amount of DNA, but it may not be high enough quantity and quality to, to do the whole genome sequencing. If we got five or ten mils, there should be plenty. But I guess my question, if you said that a few years from now, it's going to be a thousand dollars of yeah. bank and, and all the people in this room, and we encourage for the next few years people to bank that blood, mm -hmm. that when the time comes when we wanted to do that, mm -hmm. it could be done from that. Sure. Sample, yeah. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. We've, we've gone back and taken samples out of the freezer. It's like, oh, we never solved this <laughs> and, you know, pulled one out that's a, a good case to do um, and, and it's worked you know, just fine. So, the folks, the cheek swabs for the Chick DNA Bank, you can do the Chick DNA Bank by cheek swabs and those go to UC Davis. And by doing some um, special tweaking of the DNA and, and uh, some extra processes, the folks at Davis have been able to get that to work, but almost nobody else does. <laughs> so, it's just better, you know, the blood sample isn't that big a deal. Um, just. Do you want to work at all with the veterinary school at the University of Wisconsin? Yeah, actually the Cana Corso came from Wisconsin. Because we had a water spaniel that was treated there like 22 years ago for the Uh-huh. And they kind of fed her on some meds actually that I think were, you know, human meds yeah. or MS or AL right. or something. Yeah, there was a researcher down in Florida that um, initially proposed that uh, DM was the equivalent of MS in humans, and he had a whole bunch of supplements and um, uh, other stuff to give your dog as a treatment, but there's no published proof that that does anything useful. Well, she, so. she was with us for three years after the onset, so. Yeah, what Dr. Coates recommends when, the, when they're showing clinical signs is to keep them in the best physical shape you can for the longest time. So, you know, mild to moderate exercise. Um, if they like to swim, which your breed should, <laughs> swimming is good exercise because it's non-weight bearing and um, they can get a good workout. They don't have to balance, they don't have to carry their weight and they can get a good workout. So keeping the muscles as functional as possible for as long as possible is really the best thing that we can do for them right now until we have proof of some of these other things. So there are some people that are throwing stem cells at it. Well, it, that's highly unlikely to make it to work. Um, it might make the dog feel better for a while, but it's not going to stop DM because it works differently than what, what stem cells do. <laughs> so. I do, I, my dog, uh, Onset at DM at 11. Uh -huh. And uh, I took it to the University of Minnesota, chiropractic, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, you name it, we did it. At 12, we put him to sleep. Mm -hmm. I did have the necropsy. Yeah. I don't, um, it was, came back DM definitely. Yeah. I don't know where those results are. I have Do you know University if they did? Minnesota. Okay, and the pathology, the pathology report you got was from Minnesota? If you have a copy of that or if they have a copy of it, if they can send it to us and if we have DNA, then I, I can get that to Dr. Coates and she can add it. Yeah, that doesn't help us because AKC doesn't share. <laughs> and they shouldn't, really. You know, the, the AKC DNA for parentage and, and identity should they don't share that with researchers at all. That's proprietary stuff. And really the people that get worried that the gene police are gonna come and shut them down, it really should be kept separate. That's AKC's for identifying dogs, ours is for disease research, and it really should be kept separate. So. This is somebody wonders whether you have their DNA, their dog's DNA. Uh-huh. 
you, they can just contact you directly. Yeah, they can email me, and you might have to give me a poke a couple of times because they got me doing so many things that I sometimes it gets lost in the shuffle and I'll apologize in advance and I'm not ignoring you I'm just buried so you know you have permission to poke me until I respond so <laughs> and then the other thing is that for now I mean the, you know the five thousand or six thousand dollars for a dog and then five thousand I said that's really out of our reach right now yeah but one of the things that we could do would be in the um, get as much Chihuahua. DNA well, through right the, through all of a Yep. You, yep. Or send it directly to you. Which yeah. Um, or for they would make it, it available to other yeah. researchers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, if you know it's one that you might want to do the whole genome sequence on at some point, I would send us a good s sample directly to our lab so that we don't it doesn't get shared. Um, but you might want to send a second sample to the Chick DNA Bank so it can be shared. So if we were to but. do a blood draw here at Nationals next year, send, you send two samples. You, you could, you could, yeah. I mean, to get the or if you for if you bio. did, you know, if you're doing five to ten mils, we're going to get a ton of DNA out of that. We're really good and efficient at at getting DNA out of blood now. So, you know, if we have a note that says, "Hey, this is one we might consider doing a whole genome sequence on at some point," we'll just make as much DNA out of it as we can, and there should be plenty for both uh, for us and for the Chick DNA Bank. Puppy testing, you said yeah. at about four weeks for puppies on the cheeks wall. Yep. You can order them you can order them the day they're born and then the kits will be there ready and waiting, but don't use them until they're at least three or four weeks old. Can you do it from Dewclaws? We used to do DNA from Dewclaws, but we found out that um, especially as we've got more and more sensitive machines, if there's any pigment in there at all, it really fouls things up. And then if we purify and purify and purify and purify, then we have just a speck of good clean DNA left at the end. And we've, you know, and we've, we tried having the technicians peel the skin off and just do the little meat and stuff. Okay, so that got old in a real big hurry. <laughs> and if you're doing several of those, the chances for um, cross-contamination goes way up and whatever. So it's just not, it, you know, we tried that and we tried tails on the breeds that are docked. And you know you have to skin the tail and get uh, you know it it just became a nightmare. So just on? wait till they're a little bit bigger and go ahead and do them. What's your turnaround time then from when you receive the? We tell people a plan on two weeks, but it's usually within a week. Okay. Yeah. So. Some mail time to get it to yep. stuff. So. Yeah. I got my two, 10 on Saturday. Two, maybe. Yeah. Three yeah, we have some technicians that like to work on the weekend because it's quiet and <laughs> nobody comes and, and asks them for something else while they're in the middle of something. But, but yeah, it, um, um, if you want, you know, if you've got a deadline, if you've got a time deadline, you can send it by next day mail or priority or whatever and know that it's there right away. Um, but we run that at least once a week. And so it kind of depends on, you know, which day your your sample arrives versus which day they're running the test it might it we've had some that were the next day they had a result and we've had some that were 10 days just yes. based on where you where it falls in there so but the first thing you do would be check to see if you already have it that's right we're not going to on puppies no. but <laughs> so anything else oh, man. Thanks a lot. you're welcome Thank you. <laughs>